Hollywood, you went to Dallas. I'm of the stars. A lot is happening right now. Now that the window has closed, the gateway in January has closed, and it must have left us with a lot of information that is slowly unfolding and, and unpackaging itself and gifting itself to the world. So, I was in church today, and as often happens, issues that I've been unable to resolve will come up in church to present themselves to me, and then, especially around the time of the communion taking place, the offertory, and uh, present themselves to me, and then it's, there's a, the hopeful moment when there might be a solution to this ongoing problem, and today was no exception. So today, uh, I remembered about a person, this is a Wild West story, that whose notions uh, seem so very unusual to me. Uh, he's a circle of wonder. He's a, uh, an antisocial personality. He's, uh, as, according to the astral stories, he's a cannibal. And he's leader of a group. And he, he says that he's killed 700 people. I think that might be a brag. I don't know. Maybe he did. And um, let's see. What else? Uh, he has, I've spoken in t terms of soullessness and uh, trying to explain the phenomenon that I'm witnessing in the astral stories with regard to this putative person. And um, I've come up with just a lot of things. And one of them is the physical form heresy, which you can see. It's one of my blogs. And this is the story along the lines of the physical form heresies. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this person. This person believes that when someone leaves this group, then his followers ought to catch him. And then they all ought to kill that person and, and eat them. He's a cannibal. And so I've written, because cannibalism isn't my cup of tea. And so I've attempted to resolve like the astral stories that I've heard about his penchant for cannibalism through story and song and so forth. Poems, I try to come up with something. And I've been pretty successful as far as my own peace of mind is concerned. Uh, but just to put it to you bluntly, he believes that when people leave him, uh, that they ought to eat him, he, he and his group ought to eat them, so that they remain one with him forever. It's what you might call a black communion. And oddly, this came up during the offertory and the, the offering of the body and blood of Christ uh, as salvation for the people in the church today. So, so this person believes in what I might term a black communion. And I was trying to think how to prevent future black communions on his part, because from my point of view, the point of being on earth is, is to love and serve humankind, to bring Christ's light to the world, that kind of thing. But he feels that, that a black communion and a, a Christian communion are like the same thing. He believes he's above right and wrong and that both communions are just as, each is just as ethical as the other. And uh, so I was trying to counter that. I was trying to take his point of view and uh, persuade him not to drink people's blood, you know. <laughs> and so when you, I think when you deal with a person who has those kinds of fixed ideas about reality for whatever reason, um, you need to, to deal in terms of their own, like, mental filters and mental constructs and try and present something that, that makes sense to them from that point of view. Now, um, 
Uh, so this is a person that, too, apparently that I've mentioned in terms of uh, catastrophic childhood experiences who may have, who set fire to the family house and burned up his mother and infant brother after his father had left and according to the stories and uh, there was nobody left and his mother was kind of burnt up and yeah, he was sitting in a field and there was his mother's body and he was kind of hungry he was only four years old about and um, and he tried eating a piece of his mother's charred arm you know, that got him going in terms of cannibalism as as like bringing back the mother, as bringing back the maternal love and so forth, which is what he's practicing with his followers, according to the astral stories, which in this case are pretty much out there. So um, I, once in a while, I'm all over this, this, this story, this catastrophic childhood story, and it came to me that it could be he's one of those people who's born with a lot of rage inside and who ex can express that rage through starting spontaneous fires uh, psychically and possibly that his mother's house might have burned down because he was in a fit of anger over being um, pushed out of her bed when he crawled into it for comfort. Ah, uh, she because she was nursing that new child. And so he might have started that fire uh, because he's extremely gifted psychically and in a negative way, in a way of killing and so forth. He may have started that fire to um, spontaneously as his first expression of that type of pyrotechnic gift or curse, as the case may be. Um, and that's neither here nor there. So first I tried, I was trying to create like um, reasonable doubt in his mental filter regarding the importance of eating his followers if they left the cult. And um, first I said that he said that their love would always be with him because he had eaten some part of them. So their, their individuality would always be with him throughout his life, and they would never actually have left. And the first I tried was, if he had let them leave in peace and happiness, that then throughout their lives they would remember him lovingly, and that therefore their loving hearts would be with him throughout his life, rather than the fear and the upset and the anger that they might feel if he killed them and then ate their hearts. So, so, so that was my first attempt, and I will say it met with less than complete success. Less than complete success. So I kept, as the communion was raised, as first the host and then the chalice, of Christ's blood were raised for, for our adoring eyes, I kept thinking, what, what was the key? What was the answer? What would make the difference in that person's life? And the, the thing that came through just as the chalice was lowered um, was, to, was to speak to him in this terms, amongst the people in physical terms, like the examples that were, are given in the blog about physical form heresy, which mostly had to do with his ideas and his advice to his followers, according to the astral stories, this, uh, this admonition has to do with the physical realm, physical fixes for spiritual issues. Uh, so I suggested that as he had ingested uh, the flesh and the blood of a of, uh, number of followers. I don't know how many followers uh, that he had within him, within his physical form, the DNA of these people. And that it was possible that the DNA of these people might hold the answer 
to to the issue of another way of dealing with people leaving, that the DNA that he had ingested might have that answer. And he said he would talk to his wife about that. From that, I gather he has a wife. Um, maybe, maybe the same wife for a long time, I don't know, or a new wife. So, um, so he's going to look for the answer in the DNA of the people that he's eaten. In answer to cannibalism and another way, a new way of, of, of dealing with people leaving his cult. So at least that's what the astral layers provided today at the sacred moment of, of the offertory at church. Uh, whether or not he has his answer, I have my answer, and that is that Christ's example to us through the sacrifice of his own life for his followers is, is, is a good thing for us to look at. It's a good thing for us to look at as his followers. What can we do to help other people? Not how can we end their lives? How can we make them our sacrifice? But what sacrifices can we make for the, for the people that, that, that we love and wish the best for? And so, dear reader, to begin with this perilous story of my own, here are the facts as I found them, although facts they are only in realms that surpass the understanding of most people. My feeling is that, that people of the nature, the person that I've been describing, uh, choose for their lives to stand above right and wrong but to choose for action in the world Ro what people consider to be wrong you know their ch choice is to consider right and wrong each equal possibilities uh, for action in the world and they choose what others choose to be wrong they choose killing they choose all kinds of criminal activities and bad things and things like that. Well, but the thing of it is, I feel, here we are living in the world, acting in the world, and we have to choose whether to act rightly or to act wrongly. From a practical point of view, if we act wrongly, if we break the law all the time, our tenure in physical form is likely to be brief. That is because the other people in the community won't like this, and they will take appropriate action against us. So in a way, to act wrongly is, is wrong, even from the standpoint of that lofty point of view of consequentialism that that man holds. That it's wrong because if we value our physical body, which clearly he does, if we value staying alive, which definitely he does, then, then it will shorten that length of time when we can stay alive, and that's definitely wrong, I feel. It's wrong. I heard him say to me once on the physical plane, if it be in fact the same person, he, he took me aside from the group that was walking, and he said, uh, he said, regarding, uh, I had had a h horrific dream about a man who goes out and kills people that, that night, the prior night. And as I had had the same kind of dream every other night that I had been uh, in like a phys physical locale where he was nearby. And um, so I'd had this dream, unfortunate dream about someone's life being snuffed out and a man standing by and laughing in gleeful in fact that it was happening. And so I was, you know, upset. I was upset that day, and I was walking along, and he took me aside, and he said, um, he said that he himself really enjoyed seeing people die. He said, yeah, he said he enjoyed it because because of the light that rose up from them and and went away after they. It looked pretty to him to see that light leave. Well, 
the taking of a life or the viewing of a murder or the viewing of a death takes only a moment. Death takes no more than the very last inhale and exhale and then uh, relaxation of the chest muscles, which looks to our hopeful eyes almost like an, another inhalation. At that moment, the spirit departs, and it may be beautiful to see that there is a spirit and that the spirit lives on. But the true beauty in human existence is the life that we live before that death. It's the moment-to-moment -moment choice to continue to stay alive and to continue to have an effect on the world that, that will live on after we pass. Be that effect, good or bad, those are the choices that we have in life, and I choose good. I believe in good. I believe in, in self-sacrifice and in taking good care of other people and promoting the common good in politics and in government and worldwide, you see. Not in the, in the petty wants and dislikes of one mere cult, which for its livelihood picks what it picks, whatever it is that, that helps it to stay alive, beyond the sphere of good and evil. It is evil in my eyes to act so. Why not choose the good? Why not choose the light? Why pick the dark when we can be bright? <sighs> Let us stand in the light with all our might, super bright, despite when anyone tells us. <laughs> Y'all take care. Love you lots. Bye-bye. What a talk, I tell you. On and on. <laughs> So, I've talked about this person in prior blogs and uh, here and there, kind of helter-skelter, and I thought I'd explain that uh, I'm pulling things together a little bit more in this video, uh, but that I'm, I'm kind of vague about the details, partly because almost all of my information is from the astral plane, so I'm not certain who it is that I'm talking about. And secondly, I have a concern over possible lawsuits that I might be sued if I were to be specific about someone. Whether or not it t turns out that they are the person, whether or not it turns out that such a person exists, I'm sure you'll understand that. So. So, while I'm being vague in a way as to physical facts and the physical people, I'm nevertheless trying to explain a psychic phenomenon and a, an ongoing astral story that's really very interesting to people interested in the paranormal. Uh, the person that I'm talking about appears to have a number of very daunting psychic abilities. One of them is the power to mind control people, groups of people, especially his cult. And another is the, the ability to be omnipresent, as they say, or to bring his astral presence into the energy fields of any number of people, whether one by one or many at a time, I'm not certain. Uh, could be many at a time, especially if in the same locale. Well, let me see, what else? I also experienced uh, for the interval of time that I was living near that, fairly near that person, that I think it is, um, and at long distances from that person, kind of astral rapping sounds, very loud rapping sounds, say on motel 
roofs or in the room, floors of rooms above my motel room. And uh, once I tried uh, making my motel room the top motel room and lugging my suitcases up, you know, the stairs, and then I heard noises on the roof of the building. <laughs> and uh, let's see what else. Once I was sitting in a motel room, far from this person, I thought, and I heard wham, bang, banging on the door like someone was furious and wanted to get into the room. Whammy, I, did, I thought, gee, it's too scary to open the door, you know? It was in the second floor door in the middle of the desert, and I didn't know anybody there. I had no idea what it was about. But I, And then I thought I heard a bunch of people having to party in the room up above, stomping and carrying on and just a lot of noise. But then I, after things calmed down, I went and looked and there was nobody at all in the room up, up above. And in addition, I remember staying in a particular place in a small apartment and day after day in the middle of the night, someone would, I could hear them shuffling up through the garage next to the bedroom window uh, where I slept. I could hear the footsteps slowly approaching the bedroom window. The garage was full of dust and uh, never they, it was never opened up. And I would look out the next morning and there would be no footprints in the dust. So, so here we have a couple of things. The ability to mind control a number of people. Um, power of omnipresence, being a lot of different places, these rapping sounds and banging sounds and sounds of people having like um, uh, kind of uh, riotous uh, like get togethers in the room above me, sounds of footsteps like that. I don't know what that's called. Let's see what else power to cast a certain kind of quark at other people and uh, cause them to fall down onto the ground or in a, maybe a dead faint or with disoriented senses. The power to um, the power to throw energy at people and cause them to, to collapse onto the floor or against a wall. Uh, pretty scary stuff, in my opinion, and negatively aspected, don't you think? So I was dealing with my fear of all this because fear of the unknown, for me, raises up like a kind of an anxious state, generalized anxiety state that is hard to shake, you know? Only through faith, only through prayer, through being with people who, who have uh, goodwill towards us. These are the things that help, I have found. That's an introduction. <laughs> yeah, so here's just a little more introduction. Uh, I was frightened of all this stuff that was going on and I thought it had to do with, maybe with being in this other place, not where my home is, here in Los Angeles. And so uh, when I became very frightened, I came back to my home and three things happened in pretty quick succession. My home was broken into. My uh, car was the broken into. And my storage shed was broken into. All these things happened within not too long of a space of time. And some of the people that I was afraid of uh, followed me to Los Angeles and I felt frightened of them as well. But overall, in the course of a year, I found that two years that I was less and less frightened of the people involved. And I think that had to do with them not being in the place where I was. I don't think uh, they decided to stick around near my house. That's my guess. So in a way, the lowering of my level of fear during those years, some years ago, uh, 
substantiates the notion I have that it was a particular group of people in a different place. But as I've explained, there's no way in the world I can prove it. You know, and frequently psychic intel proves wrong. It steers one in the wrong direction. And it's a better service in understanding overall the quality of the subconscious mind and how it influences uh, what happens here on Earth. So then today you see, quite some years later, I'm that much less frightened of the paranormal negatively aspected and of groups and cults and so forth that that reveal that heretofore mysterious uh, element towards the bad, towards the evil, towards bad luck in my life than I was in years past. So, so today I'm able to sit down and piece things together a little for you, my audience, in hopes that should you come across this type of situation, you will be able to extract yourself from it more quickly than was I. I finished the video and went to start my car. With no prior warning, the battery was completely dead. Was this a causal event or only a test of faith? How is one to know?